Hello and welcome to the new old computer show. Uh, today uh, we are going to uh, modify a Dallas DS12887 uh, real-time clock IC. Um, these clock ICs were often part of a mm, mid to late 90s um, PC motherboards and uh, they drove both the uh, real-time clock and the, the CMOS uh, battery. Um, that contained the CMOS battery um, on the um, uh, on the motherboards of these these PCs in in one integrated package. So basically, uh, it's it's a battery and some circuitry encased in a, in epoxy. And uh, needless to say, when those batteries, the internal batteries in those packages die, they they will. They are just lithium cells. Um, they will run, run out of juice eventually. Um, you have to replace the entire IC. And, uh, well, those ICs aren't getting any, uh, um, you know, they're, pro they're not man manufactured anymore. And, um, um, well, it's for this, for, to uh, keep vintage computers running, um, we have to find uh, creative ways of. Um, uh, keeping them alive. So this video is all about uh, how you can modify um, an existing uh, IC with um, a modern uh, part and uh, make it work again. And um, the uh, the motivation for uh, for doing this in the first place is uh, this computer I have here in my lap. Uh, this, I acquired this a few months ago. This is a uh, Canon branded early Windows 95 PC. Uh, it's the Innova Media MT9320. It's a 133 megahertz Pentium PC. I had something very similar, not a Canon made PC, but um, a no name brand 133 megahertz uh, Pentium PC back in the day. So. Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, PC of a particular vintage and specification that is um, nostalgic to me. So uh, I wanted to get this machine up and running. Um, and uh, oftentimes with these 90s PCs, they, they, they will struggle to boot if they, had, if they don't have a, a CMOS data alive. Uh, so this machine had plenty of intermittent problems uh, even when you uh, soft booted it. Um, so uh, it is paramount that we have a working um, Dallas clock chip uh, inside of this computer. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump into uh, the, uh, the modification of the chip. We have the Dallas chip sits right here. It's a Dallas DS12887A, right there, real time clock chip. Date code of 1995, and the BIOS is saying that it's, uh, it's very, very dead. Now, I think there are new, I've seen new old stock, and I've seen old, old stock of these chips sold on eBay. You know? elsewhere um, however you know you never know this that's a dwindling supply I don't think these are made anymore um, even if you buy one with a more recent date code it's going to expire sooner or later so I wanted to do a more permanent long-term uh, fix for this um, and uh, if possible I also wanted to reuse as much resources as possible so this is what I got. This is a, uh, a little board made by Glitchworks. It's actually set, it says there right in the... Uh, there we go, glitchworks.com. It says there on the silk screen. So uh, these are supposedly uh, a little, little board that goes right on top of this chip, like so. And uh, you hook it up to... Uh, some some wires or pins um, that go, that are internal to this 
this package by effectively drilling holes in it. And then you uh, supposedly just super glue this on top of the, the package here and you're good to go. And then they also very, very kindly sent a coin cell battery as part of the package. It's a CR1225, three volt lithium made in Switzerland. Let's put this aside for now. Take the little PCB out. It's the PCB. So it's it's very simple. We have the battery holder there. We have a crystal crystal oscillator for the real time clock functionality. It's it's very glued on 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 there. Yeah. And so we have positive and negative leads from the battery holder that go on down here. And then we have two pads for the oscillator. So if you look carefully there, you'll see that one end of the oscillator goes to one of these pads. The other one goes to the other pad. And it's not clear how the battery holder is otherwise connected to the oscillator. So the, the challenge here is that there is the, uh, the creator of this board, Glitchworks, hasn't really provided instructions for this particular board. So this will be a little bit of an exploration in how to install it. This is the Glitchworks website. And they talk about uh, rebuilding this for the DS1387, which is another variant of these Dallas chips. They also have a link to third party site who uh, describes different kinds of mods for similar chips. So this is the 1287A. And from, from what I read, the 1287 and the 12887 that I have have effectively the same pinout, if I'm not mistaken, which I believe means that you know we should have pretty much the same. Uh, the instructions sh here should be valid for our case as well. Um, so what we need to expose are pin 16 and 20, where pin 16 is to ground the negative and pin 20 is the positive. And to achieve that, we need to cut holes between pin 13 and 24. So on the, you know, if we look at the pin one mark on the board there, pin one right, pin one mark right there. So we need to be cut, cutting holes over here on this side. So uh, yeah, I think one thing I want to want to test. I want to see if I want to see. Um, how this little board is hooked up. So are we hooked up the negative and the positive? Are they connected also to these over here? No, they're not. So these are entirely separate. The oscillator pads, like so. Oops. So this oscillator pad here is connected to this pin. The other one is connected to the other oscillator pin. Yes. And then the, uh, the battery leads are connected to these pins right here. Okay, fair enough. So what we don't have on the, the web page is, well, it's probably, I assume that they've made it user friendly enough that these, uh, oh yeah, the, the little triangle there, that must indicate pin zero, uh, sorry, pin one, right? 
that should line up with the dot on the board on the uh, chip there and then that's these two pads then line up with pins two and three that's my assumption it's a little bit of a dangerous assum assumption but i think it's a fair one and the same goes for the negative and positive on the, the battery holder line up with pin 16 and 20 so starts at 13 right yes we will uh, we'll look at that in a moment uh, but that that's my assumption so yeah i think that'll take us at least part of the way right so uh, um i'm oh, sorry oh, yeah this this way this is how we should go on here so uh, yeah it'll be a little bit of an exploration and the worst case if i ruin this chip they're not too hard to find more of them um so yeah i'll, I'll just go crazy on this this poor thing and, and see if we can make it work um it's worth mentioning that the glitch glitchworks do offer pre-assembled variants of this product so let me drop that in here there you go so you can see that if you <laughs> add another 15 dollars to the price they can actually send you a pre-assembled -assemb replacement module which of course is mighty mm, convenient compared to messing around with uh, with tools to cut holes into um, epoxy pack packages I was cheap so I, I wanted to uh, reuse what I had I bought just this uh, replacement board like so so yeah uh, it's out of stock so I bought the last one all right so I think Without further ado, let's um, do something about this, this chip here. So we need to be cutting holes on the side here. My, my first instinct was, well, should I be lazy and just work on this chip without taking it out? But that's probably a very bad idea. I don't want to damage anything. So first course of action is to, uh, to solder this chip. Um, for that purpose, we should, uh, first of all, just unscrew release this um, motherboard from uh, from its back plane so this is this is kind of the mounting plane mounting plate that goes into the case so we need to uh, just unscrew all of these right comes right off these two rows pins need to be desoldered so there's a, there's a good chance that there's a little bit of a little bit of solder left in these through holes but we can at least get a little pick out and then just very gently pull at it and see what happens not we don't want to apply too much force so you, can, you don't want to break the pcb but okay so one side is totally loose and it's just the outer side that has a little bit more work to do so this is kind of a brute force technique but i like to just grab onto the chip and then just apply some heat you know wiggling wiggle at the pins a little bit while you wiggle this is easy to burn your fingers doing this so be careful but um there we go yep didn't show if i just put the pick just under there 
apply the minimal amount of force and uh, it should pop right out. There we go. And there's where it used to sit. So we have a notch on the board there, hopefully, so we don't know exactly how to put it back in. And minimal damage to the board. There was, I think, a little bit of solder mask that I scratched. But yeah, you, you see the salty residue from my flux there. I think I want to clean that up right away. So let's uh, put the uh, motherboard aside for now. There's a newly free chip. Now I think I really want to uh, have a look at the pinouts for this just to make sure that the oscillator, that the clock is indeed on two and three. So we do see that there's a gap between one and four, so those two pins are not hooked up to uh, to dip to dip pins. Similarly, let's see if that lines up with them. Yeah, so those pins there line up. Th those two missing pins line up with these two pads. Same goes over here. These two, so that is. 16 and 20, 13, 14, 15, 16, yes, 16 and 17, 18, 19, 20, yes. That is correct. All right, but let's uh, see if we can Google for data sheets for this DS12887 to see that the, uh, the clock chips are on the correct pins. If Mouser has data sheets. Interesting, this is marked Maxim integrated into as a manufacturer, not Dallas. So I suppose Maxim bought Dallas at some point. 12887. 12887. Typical operating circuit. Let's see if we have. Uh, is that all? There we go. So, uh, in the DIP package, right? Um, pin two and three, it says connections for standard. 32.768 kilohertz quartz crystal. The internal oscillator circuit is designed for operation with a crystal having six picofarad specified load capacitance, CL, and X1 is the input to the oscillator and can be opt optionally be connected to an external oscillator. The output of the internal oscillator, pin X2, is left unconnected if an external oscillator is connected to pin X1. Interesting. So I, I believe this what we have counts as an internal oscillator. So we should probably hook up both. All right, so we know, let's also check um, 16 and 20. So where is 16? 16 is ground, yeah, good, good to know. And okay, so 20 down there. 20 is connection for a primary battery, DS81285 only. Okay. Battery voltage must be held between the minimum and maximum limits for proper operation. If the backup supply is not supplied, VBAT must be grounded. Connect the battery directly to the VBAT pin. Diodes in series between the VBAT pin and the battery may prevent proper operation. UL recognized to ensure against reverse charging when used with a lithium battery. So there, there we have it. I think we have um, 
validated that these uh, uh, this board is is uh, spec correctly for for this uh, this device. So next step is to uh, bring out the Dremel. What is the tool? Just a regular smallish Dremel device. Some bits in here. So I don't know how well this is gonna work. I have no idea how well this uh, Dremel is gonna work on uh, this particular material. I think the only so we have these two. bits here. So this should give us and uh, I think this this might be the better choice. Let's see how well this can cut into uh, this uh, epoxy material. So yeah. It spins. So <laughs> I think a proper hobbyist would be using a, a vise to hold this in place. I don't have a vise, unfortunately, in this little home office of mine. What I'll do to uh, at least provide some protection, A to my eyes, B to the surface here, I'm going to use two things. So you have some protective goggles. Looking pretty rad. Secondly, I'm going to use this old cutting board. It's just a old discarded cutting board that used to be in the kitchen and it'll no longer needed there. It's just good to have a little bit of surface to uh, to work on. So um, yeah, this might be interesting. So I'll be very careful with my fingers. Start with the uh, real time clock pins. Let's see what happens here. Um, that exposed two leads there that looks promising I think where we should be able to connect something to that all uh, right let's uh, keep moving so we needed uh, 16 and 20 right so these are here and here 13 14 15 16 so right right there. There we go. I think that should be enough. And then let's do a 20. That also looks all right. Okay, excellent. So next, you probably just want to clean up this excess. And oh, there we go. Just, just um, pull this off with your fingers, like so. There we go. And probably want to give this a little bath. It's kind of dusty now. I think we're done with the, the Dremel for today. Oh, it's so dusty. <laughs> it's probably not healthy to breathe in this epoxy dust. <coughs> Don't need that.
cool looking glasses anymore. So yeah, we'll call that a, a decent success. The other pins are undamaged. All the fingers are undamaged. We can just drop a little bit of uh, alcohol on it, wipe it off. Nope. All right. So uh, next up is to uh, attach this board. So we just need some uh, some leads here. For this purpose, I, I've saved just a few uh, little uh, component legs here, typically from capacitors. So this may might be a fairly convenient option to just connect these up up like so. Maybe, yeah, should work if I just bend and bend them over here to attach to the the pad a little. Yeah, that might be a decent option. So let's get four of these little legs. Maybe I don't need four, but for starters, just to make this easy, I'm just gonna attach these assays to each of these pads, bend them over, and then attach them to uh, the exposed pads on the, uh, the IC there. So um, to apply some fresh solder to the pads so that we can work on them. So let's heat up the pad, put some solder on, heat up the pad, put some solder on. So not much room to work with there. Um, so yeah, it might be tricky to uh, attach them on this side because the pads are so narrow, they're kind of obstructed by the battery holder. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, this is not working. <laughs> oh, this is so fiddly. Plus, it's still the entire work area is just covered by this dust. It's kind of gross. Some more solder onto that. Okay. It seems to be on there now. Next leg. So Kind of got stuck on there by chance. It's floating around. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't think this is a great, great bond. Maybe it is. But I think I should redo it. That's better. Okay, those are the hard ones. So I think these are gonna be a little easier over here. So 
somehow I got all of the on there. I don't think. Uh, yeah, not, they're not the prettiest joints. I can always touch them up later when I've attached. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, I need to redo this. This is at an angle there. That's, that's not a good. That's not a good. Uh, okay. That is marginally better. See, so yeah, once I attach this, I can always touch up these joints. So my idea was now when I have them on there, I can just bend these leads over like so with my finger. Like so. Bend it over. Bend it over. So we have a semblance of like a attachment area here. This should go on like so. Yeah, looks looks pretty good. There you go. So we have some overlap there. Some overlap here. So I was thinking of uh, prepping these uh, these pads here on the in the IC. So let's put some uh, solder on them. So we tinned our joints. Now let's uh, see what we want to do next. So I was thinking to get a little bit better adhesion here, I'm going to do something less drastic than super glue. I'm going to use this permanent, permanent uh, double-sided tape from 3M. So let's grab whatever the length of this IC, maybe this much. Should be all right. Put that on here. There, it goes on. Seems all right. Can we, uh, okay, it's not really ad adhering very well. Let's see if this, oh, there we go. So, looks all right. And then we put the uh, PCB on top there. There we go, push down. Yeah, it's on there, not too bad. This uh, makes it easier for us to rework this. If it turns out this chip is dead, or if something else goes wrong, then we can. It's easier to to get this PCB off again. Hopefully, that should not be needed. But uh, yeah, let's see if we can uh, solder these leads on here. Yep, at a glance that looks alright. Seems like we have a uh, decent joints there, so we should uh, cut off the excess leads. Might have been a good idea to do that beforehand, but then we wouldn't have that utility of, of holding down the pin while uh, soldering. 
So let's get our flush cutters. Um, best course of action might be just to bend these out like so and cut them here. And out. So <laughs> definitely hack job. You want to be careful not to uh, to short anything out against these exposed leads while in the computer. We'll um, have a look. Maybe I need to cover those up. But um, but for now it just looks all right. So yeah, uh, let's take the opportunity to touch up the joints on top now when we have a bit of a sturdier attachment there. We have the old multimeter out now. We can do a continuity test just to make sure that we have, first of all, we don't want shorted leads between the two oscillator legs. But we want continu continuity from the edge here to the leg there, and then from the other joint down there to the leg here. Okay, that's good. Same goes for these two. We want continuity from this solder blob leg here to the this terminal on the battery holder and same for this edge all right so it seems uh, everything is um, well put together hopefully so uh, without further ado we should put this back into the uh, the computer so um, yeah let's do that so now we used uh, we have this little triangle now which is uh, our pin one indicator should go in the uh, same direction as the notch so let's see if we can we can get this chip back into this spot here yep seems to have gone, gone in there well and let's use our blue tech trick i have a piece of used blue tech here that i like to use this is helpful for keeping components in place while soldering them now we can take the blue tack off. Chip is on there. Pretty nice and flush. Let's do the rest of the pins. So yeah, the very modified chip is in, uh, in place there. So we should definitely put a battery in. One coin cell battery. And uh, it says cut here. So, yeah, so we want the, the negative facing downwards like so. All right, it's in there. All right, so the computer is back together. It's time for the moment of truth. Monitor is connected. I put in the VGA card. I have the keyboard hooked up. Let's see if a uh, computer explodes or not. No fireworks. All right. CMOS checks on bad. CMOS display type wrong, wrong setup. So doesn't complain about the battery anymore. That is very uh, encouraging. So let's uh, run setup. Okay. 
We're good with this for now. We uh, save changes and exit. Uh, let's uh, test the cold boot. Let's turn this off altogether. Uh, like so. Let's wait a couple of seconds. Turn it back on. Will you remember the settings? Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. It's working now. So there you have it. That's uh, one way you can uh, modify your Dallas DS12887 uh, real-time clock and CMOS battery integrated circuit. And if you enjoyed this uh, this episode of the new old computer show, don't, don't forget to subscribe. Don't to forget to hit that like button if you liked this video and um, see you all next time. Bye.